Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us today at Temple Baptist Church for our online service. And we have to say Happy Father's Day to all the dads, to all the men out there. Happy Father's Day. Our kids usually hand out a little treat. Sorry you guys are missing that. Maybe when we're back together again we can hand that out. But they have a poem that they include with it, and I'm going to read that for you now. To be a father figure, you don't have to be a dad. Just share your love and wisdom, and of that I will be glad. So thank you, men, for sharing your love, your wisdom, and having impact on our children. We're so appreciative of that. Happy Father's Day. We are looking forward to having Chaplain Jill Bryan back with us on July 5th. So mark that on your calendars. Though always exciting to have Jill around. And today we're going to be enjoying a message from Dave Breckheisen on compassion. And he'll also be sharing an update of what's going on with himself and Jossie. We thank you again for joining us and we hope you enjoy the service. Mariah, and we are the Breck Hey, I'm Luke. And I'm Liv. And some people think we live downtown. But this is where we live, on Chicago's west side in East Garfield Park. Hi, Temple family. It's Jossie Breck -Eisen. And I'm Dave. Jossie and I have been blessed to live with our three kids, who you just met, on Chicago's west side for the past 25 years. Jossie grew up at Temple Baptist Church. So we're always glad to connect with anyone from there. We're thankful that the church and so many people from Temple have supported us so generously. Now for a quick update. We've been in transition for a couple of years. We focus most of our time in ministry to youth and their families. I've been program director for a couple of youth programs, spending time most recently leading outreach and mentorship programs that focused on training mentors to impact the lives of teens for Christ. My passion is to see young people thriving in relationship with their families, the church, and Jesus. But so many young people in Chicago haven't had the chance to connect in meaningful relationships. Many of our neighborhood have suffered under the effects of societal racism that has resulted in generational poverty and broken families. For the four young men that I've discipled for the last eight years, none of them have had the reality of growing up with their father in their home. See, these young men need to be connected to godly men so they can learn how a man follows God and leads his family. They need to see the value of education. They need to learn emotional strength and how to have passion with skill and integrity. Thankfully, God is guiding these young men in all of these areas. However, so many of the stories of the young men here do not end this way. Recently, I realized that I knew 14 young men by name who died by gun violence in a span of just two years. Through the devastation of some of those specific stories, God has renewed our vision to serve here. I am actually now working for one collective. They strive to bring people together to help the oppressed. And I'll be focusing in the following areas. I'll continue to mentor and disciple young men and work to train even more mentors. As a one collective catalyst specifically, I'll be working with churches and ministries and organizations to help them network and build more cohesive relationships for mobilizing resources to those in need. I specifically want to help young people have greater access to trauma resources. So I'm excited to be working with One Collective and their model of serving others while staying behind the scenes and joining where God is at work in the community. So take a look at the following video on how One Collective serves people around the world. Thanks for the opportunity to share today. One Collective has an audacious goal. We want to change the world. That's a big statement. Here's how we're trying to do it. Picture a community anywhere in the world. Every community has needs. And in Luke chapter 4, Jesus talks about oppressed people we might call the poor, the slave, and the blind. 
These people represent needs in the community that have to do with poverty, like lack of food, water, or jobs. Physical oppression, like refugees, child labor, and human trafficking. And spiritual blindness, people who have not yet discovered the true love of Jesus. There are also people in the community who are ignored or forgotten completely. They are who we call the invisible. While every community has oppressed people, the good news is that there are many others who are ready to come alongside and help. In almost every community, there are passionate but under-resourced locals doing their best to make a difference. Often, single focus organizations will also join a community seeking to meet specific needs. Here's the catch. These single focused organizations and those passionate locals rarely find each other. Often, everyone kind of does their own thing. In addition, focusing on only one specialty will rarely see a community become fully transformed. That's where we come in. At One Collective, we bring people together to help the oppressed. We start by sending a trained leader to humbly go into a community. This leader, who we call a catalyst, acts as a general contractor, someone who can bring everyone together to create a strategy that will address all of the needs in the community. After the plan is built, a catalyst may bring in additional workers from one collective. We also partner with churches, businesses, schools, and governments to create even greater unity and impact. There's one more piece that we need to see a community transformed, and that's you. Where might you fit into this picture? Catalysts, teammates, partners, donors, and prayer warriors. How might you use your gifts and skills to come alongside the oppressed? At One Collective, our mission is to bring people together to help the oppressed. We work so that in communities all around the world, no one is invisible and everyone has access to food, freedom, and forgiveness. We'd love for you to join us. Good morning, everybody. It's so great to be here. What a beautiful day to worship the Lord together. Before we begin, I'd like to read from 1 Chronicles 16. It says, Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his dwelling place. Ascribe to the Lord all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord glory do his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let's sing it together. Come. Come. Now is the time to worship. the 
Hello, I'm Dave Breckeisen, and in the recent months, I've had the enjoyment and challenge of reading and studying the book of Mark with the help of two 23-year-old men that I've been blessed to walk life with. I've enjoyed their fresh outlook and questions as we've wrestled together on how Jesus discipled and cared for people in their pain and their suffering. I also listened to a sermon a couple months ago from Mark 4 when Jesus calmed the storm. One of my all-time favorite stories of Jesus' power and his rescue. When he said, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? I realize again how timeless those words are and so relevant in our current times. Jesus was right. We shouldn't be afraid. Fear is a result of misplaced faith. And he wants our faith firmly placed on him. But how can we be moved to step out in faith? Uh, let's pray. Father, thank you for the blessing of today. Thank you for your church and calling us to be your body. May you, God, show us more of you today and please show us more of how to love. Amen. I do want to look at the book of Mark today, specifically the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000 in Mark 6. But we're not going to look at the whole story, as miraculous as the story of Jesus is, of providing food. But if we pause earlier, actually, at verse 34, I believe we'll see deeper into the heart of Jesus. Let's read from Mark 6, 30 to 34. It reads, the apostles returned to Jesus and told them all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. Verse 32. 
and they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them coming and going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. So here in chapter 6, we find Jesus in full discipleship mode, teaching his disciples by sending them out on mission. We pick up in verse 30 with the disciples returning and Jesus listening to their stories. Then Jesus withdraws with them. He says in verse 31, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. You see, Jesus wanted to give them rest and refreshment and a space to process, to eat, and to laugh together. They even pushed off in a boat for some privacy, but it didn't stay that way. Verse 33 tells us that many people saw them, recognized the group, and then gathered ahead of them, almost like an ambush. It ended up being over 5,000 people. So much for the retreat. We don't know how long the time of separation together with the disciples was. But when Jesus ended up back on the shore and saw the crowd, Mark records something significant about Jesus's heart. When Jesus saw the great crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. See, he sees the people not only as those without food, but without direction, without a leader to care for them, without someone to guide and direct them. See, Mark uses a million dollar word here to show us what is happening in Jesus' heart. He uses the word compassion. Now, in his lightest form, compassion can mean sympathy or having pity, but there's much more to it. The Greek form also means to be moved in your bowels. We don't understand this much today because we think of the heart as the depth of emotion. The bowels to us are indigestion or, or sickness, but for the ancient writers, the bowels are where the deepest emotions are felt and come from. Compassion here in Mark is Jesus being moved at the depth of his being. He was experiencing a human body. So, so we can be thankful that Jesus was not able to just see us spiritually and then have compassion for us. But Jesus was experiencing the physical and emotional sides of it as well. And I love that picture. And he gets it. See, we see other places of Jesus sharing a significant emotion for others. In John 11, Jesus was moved deeply in his spirit to where it says, Jesus wept. See, he shed tears over the pain that Lazarus' family was experiencing over Lazarus' death. Even though he knew, Jesus knew that he was going to raise him from the dead, he still felt that pain and wept. Also in Luke 19, we see again the depths of Jesus' compassion for all of us, for all of his people. In the triumphal entry story of Jesus coming into Jerusalem with all the singing and worship, actually the highlight time that we celebrate every year, Luke tells us that when Jesus saw the city, when he saw the city, he wept over it. See, he saw the coming destruction and the pain that would come against his people when Jerusalem was destroyed. And he was gripped by it. Jesus' compassion and his tears show in his ability to be affected by the pain of others. And he's willing to sit in it and let it affect him deeply, even though he has all the answers and all the solutions. This compassion is where Jesus starts from. That's where God the Father starts from in seeing us as people to be rescued. See, as believers, we know that this is the character of God, and we celebrate that over and over again. But we're also thankful that God doesn't stop with just feeling compassionate. 
He acts out of that compassion. God was moved to act. You see, compassion is not just a feeling or even deep empathy, but its definition is a desire to be moved to action, a desire to alleviate or help with what is causing the pain of others. See, Jesus saw in, the, in, in Mark 6, in the crowd, he saw them as helpless and in need of guidance. Guidance. Mark 6 says that he taught them many things and then he even fed them. See, I can check how compassionate a person that I am, not by how I feel, but how I follow up on how I feel. I am a compassionate father when I get, get my son the proper medical care when he breaks his ankle, after he broke his ankle. I'm a compassionate neighbor when, while my neighbor's house was on fire, I was able to grab my friend's four-year-old son out of his father's arms when he came running out of the house with him. I am a compassionate friend when I visited my friend in jail, he, when he needed friendship and he needed hope, and then helped him look for a job when he was released. Now, I could have felt just sympathy in all of these situations, even some empathy, but these are just a few of my success stories that I'm actually sharing. There are many more where I failed and I felt short. I felt way short of having been moved to action. I could list those in a long, long list. But in the depth of compassion, feeling it first, then feeling it enough to act, that's when we are following the example of Jesus. Now, right now we have two societal crises going on. The discord from the pandemic of COVID-19 and also the upheaval over racial injustice. They're both hotly debated, causing people to draw political lines and take sides. What a polarizing time. See, what can be lost in all of the conversation is the actual suffering and pain that's affecting millions of people. We as believers, with Jesus as our example, should be the first to have compassion. But that's not what we see in mainstream media, our social media feeds, or in our personal conversations. It seems that we are forming so much of our opinions based on our perception of right or wrong. Even our political beliefs or the leaders that we like, or those we don't agree with. But what if we're moved by compassion in the depths of our bowels to be affected enough to listen without regard for our alliances or our past beliefs? What if we listened for the pain and suffering of human beings and that's what guided our interest and our actions. You see, Jesus clearly had an agenda on earth during his slow, very deliberate couple year walk to the cross. But he wanted to love and show compassion to a lost world while he was here. He wanted to be present and let the pain of people affect his heart and his soul. You see, Jesus wanted to see for us to see a real life example of him as a person responding with both love and action. So for us in these turbulent times, we have a responsibility as believers to not stand in judgment of others suffering and pain. We should not be judging others and interpreting their agony. It's incredible that we can doubt the information and stories of others and then search for news that fits with our preconceived opinions. Now, I'm not saying that there's not false information out there. There's plenty of that. But how much information do we need to see to be convinced that love and compassion should be our response right now? Somehow, 
Many of us would rather be skeptics and left just dialoguing about it. People are dying by the thousands. Healthcare and frontline workers are exhausted and they're dying too. People's businesses are failing. Black Americans are crying out for justice in a system that causes them to live in fear and on edge of possibly being killed. They live in an America that has for hundreds of years told them that they are not equal by how they are treated in many of our workplaces, our communities, our schools, even our hospitals. You can listen, really listen to hear and not think of anything else. See, racism is a sin in our country that is not just in the past, but it's plaguing the depths of our country's soul. See, I've lived in, I've lived for over 20 years in black communities in Chicago. I know what I've seen as a white person, it pales in comparison to the actual experiences of black Americans. It's just a small, tiny view. But myself, I've been pulled out of my van in a police stop and watched as two of my black friends were handcuffed, literally handcuffed to the luggage rail on top of our van. All the while, the police let me stand very comfortably and had a polite conversation while I answered questions. I've also spent even a few days in Rockford visiting family with a couple African-American kids that I was mentoring, only to hear later that a neighbor actually wondered if it was these two young kids that had stolen bikes from their garage. I've walked into a store five minutes after my African-American friend was told that the store was not hiring anybody right now. But when I walked in, I was offered an application and an opportunity to meet the manager right then. These stories do not stop. Millions of these play out day after day. So one thing I've learned over and over again is that I can't possibly understand what it means to not be white in our country. But I've learned that I must see and hear their stories as reality. The trauma, the challenges, the hopelessness that caused black Americans to cry out in pain. And still, even believers judge their movements, their protests, their riots, Brian Stevenson of the Equal Justice Initiative says that this violence that we see is rooted in hopeless despair. So for us believers, in the face of the unknown of, of both the pandemic and none of us ever having been here before, not our leaders, not our doctors, none of us, and in the face of the reality of the racial injustices of our world, we have to be willing to say, I don't understand. I will listen, especially if you're white. I have to say this, that my perceptions could be flawed because of my perspective. And to then say, let me learn so that my heart can love like Jesus loved. So I can have compassion in the depths instead of being judgmental and passive. I'm afraid that the non-Christian world is moving ahead of us quicker and being more willing to love and bring change to a hurting world quicker than us. See, Jesus moved continually into the uncomfortableness of others suffering so he could be a conduit of love and healing. We have to be willing to get uncomfortable. For those of you that have been misunderstood in the COVID-19 battle, who may have lost jobs and now businesses, and, and for those who are not white listening to this, I'm sure you are understandably exhausted, maybe 
greatly disappointed in the church and believers. And perhaps battling bitterness, hopelessness, and even anger. I pray that you will have a new measure of grace and patience for us who don't understand. We all must be conscious of the enemy's work and his lies in dividing us and keeping us from moving forward in compassion for one another and for changes that will bring more equality. See, Jesus showed us that we are responsible for entering into each other's suffering in order to understand. In the story of the Good Samaritan, Jesus tells the story of a man robbed, beaten, and then left on the side of the road to die. Then a Levite and a priest, both religious, both religious leaders, failed to be givers of compassion to the suffering robbery victim. They missed their chance. Actually, they chose to miss their chance. But we need to search our hearts and actions so we are not the religious people who completely miss what is truly going on in our world today. There are millions of suffering people on the side of the road, beat down and robbed right now. See, the Good Samaritan didn't just evaluate whether the man's suffering was legitimate. He acted on the merit of the pain that he saw before him. He used his time and his resources, his own money. He paid for the man's medical care. He paid until the man was back on his feet. Jesus said the man who acted on his compassion was the loving neighbor. So for us as the church, the pain and the suffering that's right before us now might be some of the most significant opportunities in our lifetime for us to be loving neighbors, to be loving our neighbors. See, in Colossians 3, Paul cast the vision for us to have compassionate hearts, humility, bear with one another, as well as many other things. We may want to love like Jesus did, but our intentions will be nothing if we don't have the humility to listen and to learn and to bear with one another by getting involved, getting involved with our time and our resources, our societal positions, our wisdom, and the list goes on and on with what we, the church, have to offer. Jesus gives the example of love and compassion that we need, the ultimate example, to see others with the eyes that will move us to feel it in the depth of our being, in our bowels, <laughs> and then to move forward with both words and sacrifice. That's what the world needs for healing. I pray that we can be God's tools for true comfort and change and healing with Jesus as our example. Let's pray. Jesus, there is so much unknown and so much pain. We're often lost in how to love well and and show compassion as the body of Christ, God. Please have mercy on us and give us wisdom to see others with your eyes. Give us the courage to act, Lord, please. Give us the hearts to love fully with your passion, God. We need you. We need you every day. We need you to know how to love others and love the world. Please help us, God. In Jesus' mighty name, 
we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. As uh, we prepare for the benediction, now I'm going to say a, a few words first. Uh, first of all, thanks to uh, Jennifer, Rob, Fred, and everybody that's helped put together um, different parts of this this worship service. I hope it's been a blessing to you. Most of all, um, this is this is the offering that we lift up to the Lord every week as our offering to Him. And now it's time to go and begin our our week. Uh, hopefully, you have the the day off. Some of you, like me, have to work today, but. Uh, um, but now begins your offering to the Lord, and that's the way that you live for him this week. You yourselves are the offering, and that's why God tells us, offer your bodies to me as a living sacrifice, Romans 12, 1. And uh, so uh, a couple other things I want to say is I had a great time with those of you that came out for the grad uh, the grad prayed last Sunday. Thank you to all of you that, that were able to come out, and for you that weren't able to come, we had a great time. Um, just riding around the city, congratulating our grads. Big thanks to Fred and uh, the others. I think of the Lees. I think of others that helped put work into that. We had cray paper they had on our on our rear view mirror, side view mirrors, and um, uh, it was just a, a good a good time. So uh, so yeah, thank you to those who helped put that together and participated. I also want to remind you of the quarantine commands. We are still in quarantine. And so these, these instructions that I gave you as your pastor are still in effect. And I hope you're putting them into practice, holding to them, not forgetting about them till this quarantine is done. Um, so uh, maybe go and find those. If, you've, if they've forgotten from your mind, I'll review them for you here. Stay proactive physically, mentally, socially. So if you're getting that exercise, whatever that looks like healthily for you, keeping your, your mind um, healthy as well, mentally feeding yourself good things, socially staying connected to other people. And then those three keys for your spiritual health that I gave. Number one, keep abiding in the vine. It's you staying connected to Jesus, talking to him and listening to him, hopefully a little bit every day. I'd like you, all of us to do that. Number two, prioritizing these weekly smogs. So much work goes into them. Don't miss this time to gather as a church family. It's the only time we have as a whole church family now in the week to, to gather together. And then number three, keep serving each other using your gifts. All right, so those are the three keys to spiritual health. So stay proactive, physically, mentally, socially, and then these three keys for spiritual health. Keep those going, guys. Stay strong, and uh, and may God add his blessing to you as you do, and it'll help keep us strong until we can uh, hopefully soon meet together again in person. All right, I got a psalm to read, and then, then we'll uh, have you stand for the benediction. Psalm 147, 11. The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. Would you stand for the, and receive the benediction? Go in peace this week, living out his compassion, fearing him, and putting your hope in his unfailing love. Amen. We'll see you next week, guys.